Well, good evening and welcome to this next talk that 42 Bedford Housing are doing in the series of disrepair presentations. This one focusing on preparation for trial um, being presented by myself and Stefan. I'll be dealing with the first part of it for around 20 minutes, focusing on um, whether or not CPR part 18 might assist you in narrowing the issues, identifying the issues ahead of um, the trial. And then once you've been able to do that, if, if that's applicable, then whether or not, uh, I should say, what sort of um, evidence you want to be advancing ahead of the trial, factual and expert. And then once I've done that, I'll hand over to Stefan, who will talk about some other matters of importance that need to be addressed prior to trial. So, starting with the basics, CPR part 18, um, it might be felt, could assist in a case of residential housing, landlord and tenant disrepair. Um, just to go through 18.1, the court may at any time order a party to clarify any matter which is in dispute in the proceedings or give additional information in relation to any such matter, whether or not the matter is contained or referred to in a statement of case. Now that's subject to any rule of law to the contrary, which is really a reference to things like the rule against self-incrimination or the fact that certain things will be privileged. Obviously, it doesn't override important principles like that. And then if the court does make an order for the clarification or for the further information, then the party against whom it is made must file his response, serve it on the other parties, and do so within the time that is specified by the court. So that's really just a whistle-stop tour of CPR part 18. But as I was saying, it might be felt that it's particularly um, useful in cases where there's a disrepair dispute residentially, that is between landlords and tenants. There's a few examples that I think um, are likely to, to, uh, to crop up in cases like this. So one of them might be in the particulars of claim, particulars of breach, uh, and you as the defendant landlord are perhaps unclear about uh, when it's suggested a particular item or something that's covered in the subject matter of the covenant uh, fell into disrepair. That's something that part 18 could address. Knowledge or notice, that is knowledge of the need held by the landlord to carry out remedial work is an essential precondition of liability in section 11 Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 cases. Um, and it may be, again, that you as the defendant read the particulars of claim and think that it is lacking in the sort of particularity you need to understand the case that you are to meet in terms of when you were put on notice. From the claimant's point of view, however, often it might be that a defendant in their defence says, for example, works have been done, uh, and indeed may go further and say, well, works have been done to such an extent that actually there's no need for specific performance, there's no need for injunctive relief, but you as the claimant might be of the view that works have not been done or that the defence simply doesn't say when they were done uh, and what was done at that time. So again, part 18 could assist there. So it does, these sorts of disrepair disputes do lend themselves quite well to uh, the application of part 18. Uh, just a few basics here, it can be used at any time CPR 18.1, to clarify any matter which is in dispute or to give additional information in relation to any such matter. Likely to be in a statement of case, like I was saying, maybe the particulars of breach or the particulars of notice within the particulars of claim or the defence. It doesn't have to be, but in my, in my experience, it's likely that that's the documentation you're looking at. It's not applicable to small claims, um, although the court still has a power on its own initiative to um, 
order clarification or further information. But something that I'll come on to on the next slide, and this is really the key theme that, that pervades the rule, is that the requests and the replies are to be reasonably necessary and proportionate, which includes costs. CPR eight, part 18 really just has two bits, 18.1 and 18.2, but it's supplemented by quite a prescriptive and quite helpful practice direction. And it explains the procedure in terms of making the requests, uh, responding to the requests, and then as I come on to the court ordering clarification or further information. So to start off then with the party that's making the request, rather than just applying straight to court, um, you serve first on the other party, a written request that seeks the clarification or the further information. And I'll come on to the form of that written request. You give a date by which the response should be served, which needs to be reasonable based on the facts of the case. 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, whatever is felt is reasonable. And then this is a quote from paragraph 1.2 of the practice direction that supplements part 18. The request should be concise and strictly confined to matters which are reasonably necessary and proportionate to enable the first party, the requesting party, if you like, to prepare his own case or to understand the case he has to meet. So again, we see their references to reasonably necessary and to proportionality. The request could be by a letter or, and in my view, this is likely to be more appropriate in a separate document, letter is really more appropriate for very simple, very straightforward matters. But in any event, be headed with the name of the court, the title uh, and the number of the claim, the claim number, sorry. And then in its heading, state that it is a request, it is made under part 18 identify the first party, that is the party making the request, identify the second party, if you like the party from whom the request is sought, and then state the date on which the request is being made. Set out in separate numbered paragraphs each request for information or clarification. So if there's three requests, there'd be three paragraphs. Where a request relates to a document, identify the document and if relevant, the paragraph or words to which it relates. So it might be, for example, in relation to what is asserted at paragraph seven of the particulars of claim, and then your question might follow. And just continuing, state the date by which the first party, the party asking the questions, expects a response to the request. And then if you're not doing it in the form of a letter, be prepared in such a way that the response may be given on the same document. To do this, the numbered paragraphs of the request should appear on the left hand half of each sheet so that the paragraphs of the response may then appear on the right. And then an extra copy should be served for the use of the other party if that method is being um, adopted. So effectively you have your requests on the left and then there's space for the other party to reply to those requests on the right. So the request has been made and then we, I'll just turn to the procedure for responding. The response will be in writing, it will be dated, and as I'll say again later, it will be signed, or at least all of this should be occurring by the party or by a legal representative. If the request was made by a letter rather than in a separate document, then you can reply in a letter, but you must identify, or sorry, the letter must identify itself as a response to the request and deal with no other matters other than responding to the request. And if not a letter, again, some matters that the practice direction lists uh, some elements that is as to be present be headed with the name of the court, the title and number of the claim, just basic stuff as per the, uh, the same, sorry, for the request itself. Identify itself as a response to that request. 
repeat the text of each separate paragraph of the request and set out under each paragraph the response to it. Refer to and have attached to it a copy of any document not already in the possession of the first party, that is the party asking the making the request, which forms part of the response. And then serve the response on every other party and file it with the court, a copy of the request and the response. And the response, as I said, should be verified by statement of truth. Of course, the scenario may arise that the party who receives the request can't comply at all or, 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 or just in time. Or maybe you're unwilling, you don't think it's necessary. If you object, object to complying with the request or part of it or are unable to do so at all, or within the time specified, the 14 days, the 21 days, whatever it might be, inform the party that's making the request promptly and do so in any event within that time. And you may do so in a letter or in a separate document, but in either case, you must give reasons and where relevant, give a date by which you do expect to be able to comply. Moving on then, and to refer back to CPR 18.1, which is fundamentally a power for the court upon application to order a party to clarify particular matters or to give further information on particular matters. If the requesting party is at that stage, then you use the N244 application notice, attach a copy of the order that you want the court to make to the application notice, describe any response that has been received. The practice direction that supplements part 18 permits evidence, but question whether or not this sort of procedure really requires, for example, a witness statement advancing evidence. And then importantly, if no response was provided to the initial request, then, quote, the first party need not serve the application notice on the second party, and the court may deal with the application without a hearing. That's paragraph 5.5 of the practice direction to part 18. Only if at least 14 days have passed since the request was served and the time stated in it for a response has expired. But otherwise, uh, that is, if a response was received, the application notice must be served on the other party, and indeed on all of the parties. In terms of teeth, what are the consequences uh, of not responding? The court has general case management powers in CPR 3.1 in terms of making orders conditional. One of the obvious examples is to make it conditional, make an unless order, um, effectively, unless the following is clarified or the following further information is provided and a particular prescribed stated sanction will bite, which could be, if the circumstances merit it, um, striking out of the statement of case. More obviously, failing to respond adequately or at all is, is clearly a conduct issue which could and probably would be taken into account in the question of costs. So moving away from part 18, the if it's felt that it was relevant, and it might not be relevant in every single case, and it might not be proportionate in every single case, but the, the goal fundamentally is to be able to narrow the issues and to identify what are likely to be the determinative issues, the, the points on which the case will stand or fall if and when you get to trial. So the hope is that either that was clear from the start or following the Part 18 procedure that has become clear or clearer. We then move on to the question of what your evidence, claimant or defendant, needs to address. Starting firstly with expert evidence, 
obviously expert evidence must be permitted by the court and in most fast track disrepair cases most of these cases tend to be one day fast track disrepair cases that will be a written report usually of a single joint expert but not always but it is rare indeed to have live evidence in terms of making sure that the expert evidence addresses those determinative issues in terms of the claimant it may well be that the expert evidence was obtained or at least some of it was obtained pre-issue um, so the defendant really can't contribute in terms of or it need, might be too late in a particular case to contribute to the instructions but it goes without saying that the instructions should be clear concise and direct but more helpfully in terms of really focusing down on the issues that are likely to be um, instrumental. CPR 35.6 allows questions to be put. Now I'll just read 35.6. One, a party may put written questions about an expert's report, which must be proportionate to A, an expert instructed by another party, or B, a single joint expert instructed under 35.7. Now, written questions under paragraph one above may be put only once, must be put within 28 days of service of the expert's report, and must be for the purpose only of clarification of the report, unless the court gives permission or the other party agrees. Um, just before I move on to the factual evidence, the, the lay witness evidence, if you like, um, questions to an expert, could, again, a bit like part 18, could be particularly relevant here, making sure, whether you're claimant or defendant, that the essential questions are answered. If, for example, it's a case involving damp and there's an argument or is likely to be an argument about causation, identification of the damp is not the end of the story. The expert's report needs to address the cause, or the most likely cause. But then let's assume we've narrowed our issues, we've got or we're getting our relevant expert evidence, then move on to the important stage of witness statement production. Starting point here is addressing the points that remain in dispute. Now, why is that important in terms of witness statement evidence? Now, fundamentally, it just comes back to the very basic element or procedure within civil trials, which is that the statement stands as the witness's evidence in chief, unless the court orders otherwise. Now, a witness who's giving oral evidence at trial may, with the court's permission, and also with good reason, amplify his statement and give evidence on matters which have arisen since. But unless you can persuade the court that that criteria is fulfilled, 32.5 little four, you need to make sure that the witness is all those key points. And it's very risky to just hope that the court will allow the witness to elaborate on points that really ought to have been in the witness statement. That's why it's very important that you identify those issues, again, a point that I keep making, and then make sure that those issues are addressed in the evidence. Now, coming at it first, perhaps more from the claimant side, focus on the issues that remain in dispute. Now, obviously, this is fact specific. Every given case, the defendant might admit things, might require to prove things, and every case is different, and there might be things that you don't need to evidence but some of the more obvious things it's very rare for example for a defendant to say well the loss of immunity is fully accepted so that will be needing to be evidence access is another good example if the defendant says in their defense well we would have done this but for the fact that we were not able to get access clearly that's something the claimant must fully address in the witness statements the point overriding here the overriding point is to make sure that you identify the issues that remain in dispute and that your witness statement deals well with those issues. And 
finally, coming to the end of my part of the presentation. In terms of the defendant witness evidence, and I focus more here on the large landlord, the, the borough, the local housing authority, or maybe a large association, as opposed to really a, a small private landlord who's maybe just letting out on a short term tenancy. Unlike the claimant, obviously, by definition, they're not really going to have that same intimate personal knowledge of the property and certainly the intimate personal knowledge of, of the defects, uh, the provenance, the date that they arose, and indeed when particular works were carried out. A lot of it in cases of this nature is likely to come down to an understanding of procedures of um, their employer a lot of the time, the defendant. Um, and in particular their repair records so make sure not only that the witness statement addresses some of the points that i'm just going to touch upon but also that the witness themselves for the purposes of cross-examination is really able to understand and explain these things so the three one that three points that i think perhaps pop their heads up more than most being able to explain to the court how tenants go about notifying this particular defendant organization or borough or authority of issues the, the process of contact the logging of that co contact the referral on of that contact clearly going to be relevant for questions of notice and works done for example secondly and certainly one that i come across quite a lot an understanding and an ability to explain the repair records and any other similar documentation it might be that some of the references in the repair record to the outsider are not easy to understand reference numbers coding categories those sorts of things obviously the witness statement needs to be able to explain what was raised what was done if anything and when it was done which might not be immediately obvious from simply looking at a particular schedule or an excel spreadsheet or the like and then similarly, what is that defendant's process or procedure for trying to get access to a property? The witness needs to be able to understand how that defendant goes about doing that. And what about the procedure for proving that access was attempted, but then not provided? Again, the witness statement needs to be able to explain those things. So that's the end of my part of the presentation. And um, what I shall do now is I'll hand over to Stefan, who will talk about some other key elements to get on top of in advance of the trial. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. So I'm going to talk about uh, trial bundles and getting those right, uh, and then a small bit on cases where there's a claim for specific performance or an injunction uh, and dealing with costs um, briefly at the end of the trial. Uh, so where to start with trial bundles? Um, it's important to get these right. Uh, you want to aim for something that's going to be easy for the judge, counsel and witnesses to navigate. Uh, you want it to contain everything that's relevant and nothing irrelevant, uh, each document appearing once and in a logical order. Um, that can be easier said than done. Uh, and I'll take you through um, some of the rules and best practice um, for getting it right. Uh, most of what I say is applicable to paper and electronic bundles, but I'll talk uh, a bit specifically about e-bundles as well. Uh, so where to start? Um, the, the first place to look is always going to be the case management order that's been made. Um, they That will often contain quite specific uh, directions as to what the court wants to be in the bundle and how it's supposed to be put together. Uh, and those directions um, always override anything that's in the practice directions uh, or other guidance. So that's your starting point. Um, sometimes though it's uh, not always clear uh, or very full in the court order, you will then have a look at practice direction 32, paragraph 27, and that's got a number of subparagraphs uh, that deal with um, bundles in general. Um, I've put a link to that um, for ease of access on the slide, um, which you which should be clickable um, in the PowerPoint file if you've got that. Uh, there are also guides um, specific to the High Court, uh, including the Queen's Bench and the Chancery Divisions, 
Uh, now, these um, aren't strictly applicable to most disrepair claims that you'll deal with in a county court. Uh, they can be useful, though, um, the, uh, and judges will sometimes refer to them as guides to best practice, even in the county court. Uh, in the um, Queen's Bench Division, you want to look at section 14, uh, and in the Chancery Guide, it's paragraph 21.34 onwards. Uh, whose responsibility is a trial bundle? Well, CPR, Civil Procedure Rules 39.5, uh, says that it is uh, the claimant's job, unless the court orders otherwise. It's a claimant's responsibility to lodge uh, the bundle with the court. Uh, now, if the tenant, the claimant, uh, is unrepresented, uh, it may be um, at the case management hearing that the um, defendant, the landlord, if they, assuming they are also, they are represented, uh, they may be ordered to take charge of this. Um, for obvious reasons, it's usually better to have a firm of solicitors in charge of it. Uh, they may indeed volunteer to do it um, rather than leave it to the unrepresented litigant. Uh, that is um, provided for as the normal uh, way of dealing with things where one side's unrepresentative, unrepresented in paragraph, uh, sorry, in practice direction 32, um, paragraph 27.7. Uh, whoever's job it is, though, um, the two sides are expected to cooperate and to agree a single bundle. Uh, there shouldn't be two rival bundles um, submitted. Uh, so seek to agree everything. There's one caveat to that. Um, and that's if you dispute a particular document um, in terms of whether it should be admissible uh, or relevant, uh, or even in the most extreme cases, um, if there's an allegation that the document is somehow fake or forged. Uh, what um, the practice direction says is that if you agree to a document going in the bundle, um, it is taken as um, admissible at the hearing as evidence of its contents unless the court orders otherwise, or the parties given written notice of their objection to its admissibility. Uh, so there is that particular dispute. Um, when the bundle is lodged, make sure you make clear to the court and to your opponent um, that the, that particular document is not agreed as admissible and that there's a dispute. Um, the bundle uh, has to be lodged between three and seven days before trial. Um, that's also set out in CPR 39.5. Uh, bear in mind, this means uh, three clear working days um, under the CPR when it's a period of less than seven days. Uh, so that means, for example, if the trial's on a Friday, it's got to be lodged by the Monday. So you've got three clear working days in between the two dates. Uh, if the trial is on a Monday, it's the Tuesday before um, the trial, uh, not counting the weekend days. Uh, and of course, don't forget uh, to file two copies, one for the judge and one for the witness table. Uh, what goes in the trial bundle? Um, again, have a look at practice direction 32, uh, paragraph 27.5. There's a useful checklist there to make sure you've not missed out anything. The case management order, again, uh, may be quite detailed as to what needs to be in it. Um, as I said, though, it, it may not always cover it in that much detail. I've set out in the slide um, what you will usually see as the um, sections uh, in a typical disrepair trial bundle. Uh, so you've got the pleadings and orders first. Um, one point there is that um, if you've had, for example, an application made um, during the case to rely on, for, for example, new expert evidence, and that's been allowed or, or not allowed, you generally only need to include the court order um, and not the application itself because the application is no longer live it's been dealt with one or one way or the other um, the trial judge doesn't usually need to see that uh, they just need to know um, what the outcome and the order was um, expert reports uh, usually come next uh, then witness statements uh, and with that don't forget um, if you have a witness who's not coming to court uh, they need to have a uh, hearsay notice under the Civil Evidence Act um, to explain why they're not coming to court. Um, that may be, for example, if you, ha if you have a um, officer um, from the landlord who is simply explaining how a system works and um, none of their evidence is likely to be controversial. Uh, or indeed, you may have somebody who uh, isn't able to attend for any particular reason. 
Uh, then you'd normally have the general documents um, in chronological order. It's better if the defendant's a large landlord with extensive repair records to have those in a separate section by themselves. Uh, and you may have a section of medical records if, if for example, there's a, a claim by the claimant for personal injury, um, typical one being a case of um, bad mold and damp and they're alleging that um, it is uh, for example worsened a, a lung condition that they have. Uh, these sections should normally be separated by tabs um, that's always very helpful um, but make sure the page numbering is continuous from start to end uh, rather than having each section numbered from page one. It, always think about how you can keep the size of the bundle uh, to uh, the minimum that's needed. Uh, what I often see uh, in a lot of trial bundles, including in disrepair claims, is you've got one document appearing more than once at different points in the bundle, and that's usually not needed. Um, it can, in fact, annoy the judge uh, if they have done their pre-reading and they've made notes on one version of the document uh, to help them and then during the evidence they're taken to a, another version of it where they haven't got their notes. Uh, so it, it, that's also a suggestion made specifically in the Queen's Bench Guide um, to avoid duplicating documents. Uh, two common examples of that. Um, one, if you have the particulars of claim uh, and it had a, a surveyor's report or and maybe a medical report attached to it, um, you don't need to have those attachments appear after the particular claim in the pleading section. Uh, you can just have them in the expert report section in one place. If you've got witness statements uh, with exhibits and those exhibits are already in the general document section, uh, again, you don't need to have them appear twice. Um, what the Queen's Bench Guide says, uh, at paragraph 14.4 is this, uh, if the same document is included in the chronological bundle section and is also an exhibit to a witness statement, it should be included in the chronological bundle section and where it would otherwise appear as an exhibit, a sheet should instead be in inserted, stating the page and bundle number uh, in the chronological bundle section. So you just have your exhibit one, exhibit two sheets, don't actually have the document there um, as a copy after it, but put on it, this is at page uh, 250. Um, in the main bundle section. Um, common example of that might be uh, the repair manager, uh, their witness statement, well, it might exhibit um, the repair records and those could be extensive. Uh, there's no need to actually have them physically just behind the witness statement if they're already in a separate repair record section. A uh, couple of other points about the contents. Photos are often important in disrepair claims um, for obvious reasons things like um, mould, uh, the extent of it and where it is, uh, or um, uh, cracks in walls, uh, broken windows and so forth. Um, th it often gets missed um, to make sure that those are in colour um, and clear, both when you print them uh, and then if you photocopy the whole bundle, that the photocopy is in colour as well and good enough quality for the judge to see what it is um, that is, sh it is shown in the photograph. Um, page numbers, um, make sure that they're big enough uh, to be seen and that they're going to be distinct from internal page numbers that you might have in an expert's report already. Uh, so large is generally better um, and perhaps in a different font from internal page numbers that are already there. Uh, it can be helpful even to have them in a red colour if you're printing in colour. Um, make sure they're not too close to the margins of the page uh, again because if you photocopy that bundle that they might get cut off and uh, there's nothing a judge hates more than a bundle with the page numbers cut off uh, we we're all used now i'm sure to dealing with e-bundles um, after the past two years trials are still being done electronically uh, so uh, we can expect this to continue for at least some uh, of the disrepair trials there's very helpful general guidance on these on the judiciary website. Um, you've got the link there. And I pulled out some of the key points, um, which most of you will probably uh, have heard about by now, but it's always worth having the checklist. The, the number one bugbear is always page numbering, where you have one number printed on the page itself and another 
uh, in the PDF electronic page numbering. Um, and it always makes it take, tw take twice as long to tell the judge which document you're looking at for everyone to find it. Uh, the easiest way to deal with that is just start the index at page one. Um, so that will then be consistent with what's in the electronic page numbering. So the first actual document might start at page three, for example. Um, always try to have optical character recognition, OCR. Uh, that means that the uh, judge can, uh, and indeed your counsel, can scan through it by uh, using the keyword finder. Uh, it's then easy also to highlight and copy text out, uh, and it just makes um, navigating and using the bundle so much quicker. Uh, that might not always work if you have a handwritten document, but with most things that are printed, the um, app can pick it up uh, as readable text. Uh, bookmarks are always helpful. Uh, you don't need to go overboard and bookmark every single document, uh, but judges and counsel find it helpful generally if you bookmark the key ones on the PDF file. Uh, and look out as well for any pages that are rotated um, upside down or um, in landscape format uh, so that they're all going to be readable uh, straight away by the judge without them having to do any rotation themselves. Submitting the bundles, uh, the latest guidance is that the court service will accept um, attachments up to 36 megabytes. If your trial bundle is larger than that, uh, consider first of all using your uh, PDF app to compress it down as long as you don't lose too much quality. Uh, if, it's, if it's a very large one though, uh, consider seeing if the court will accept a download link from a site like Dropbox or Mindcast that's usually preferable to splitting it up into two or more separate PDF files and sending them in separate emails. Um, again, because uh, judges find that a bit more difficult to then deal with. Uh, how you deal with late disclosure, of course, is very often going to be new documents that come out um, after the bundle's been put together. Uh, and there can often be a dispute over whether um, they should be uh, allowed into the bundle. If there is a dispute, it's usually better, at least if you're looking at more than a few pages, to put them into a supplementary bundle, um, whichever party wants to rely on them, uh, and file that separately with the court, uh, making clear that um, there, there is a dispute over whether um, they should be admitted into the evidence. If they're important documents, you should consider making a formal application uh, on the N244 application notice. Um, strictly speaking, it is a matter for relief from sanctions because uh, CPR 31.21 says if you haven't disclosed the document in time, you can't rely on it unless the court orders otherwise. Uh, and some judges are sticklers for that and you'll need to explain why it wasn't disclosed earlier. If on the other hand, the parties uh, are in agreement that the new document should go in, uh, if you've got a paper bundle, you can simply insert them wherever they make, wherever it makes sense that to go in chronological order, and you can add the usual page 39A, for example, on the page numbering. With an e-bundle, on the other hand, it's always better to put those new pages in at the end, uh, because if you put them anywhere else, you'll mess up the consistent page numbering that I talked about earlier, uh, and you can uh, simply add a new section in the index called new disclosure at the end. Uh, so those were some uh, tips and guidance on getting the bundle right. Uh, uh, moving on then to a uh, point about disrepair claims where the claimant is seeking an injunction or an order for, spe for specific performance for the landlord uh, to carry out works that are outstanding, because of course uh, you'll often see that claim uh, in the particulars of claim in addition to uh, seeking damages. Now on the claimant side, if by the time of trial the work is still not done or it's been partly done or not done properly, uh, you need to show that the issue is still outstanding and why. Um, it may be that the um, deadline for exchanging witness statements and expert reports has passed. If works have been done after that point in time, uh, consider whether it's worth uh, asking the single joint expert if the parties agree uh, to do a further inspection uh, and report on it that can be added into the bundle. In the rare case where you've got two experts, it, they may need to both inspect and perhaps have an expert's discussion and reduce 
a joint statement. Uh, in, in these cases, uh, that the party should generally be sensible and cooperate um, when it's something that has uh, arisen, for example, new works being done after the deadline, as I say, for the bundle uh, to be put together or for uh, witness statements to be exchanged. Um, <clears throat> In your evidence for um, a claim for an injunction, it's important to be clear on what period uh, of time the works should take to carry out, because if you get your order, the judge is going to set um, a deadline for it to be complied with. Uh, so the expert report will normally say um, what a reasonable time frame will be, but if they haven't, uh, make sure that you ask them about it. The defendant, uh, particularly if they're um, a smaller landlord, but it can apply to any landlord, um, may have their own reason for saying that they can't do it in that period of time. If that is the case, uh, consider including in your witness statements when you prepare them uh, an explanation from somebody as to why um, you can't do it in, say, 30 days, uh, if that's what the expert has suggested and you need longer. Another reason to uh, deal with this in witness evidence uh, maybe, uh, again, if this is uh, something that's rising closer to trial, um, the defendant say they've tried to carry out the repair works, but they're not getting access uh, from the tenant. If that is the case and it's an ongoing issue um, up to trial, uh, it, you may be justified in uh, serving a supplementary witness statement that explains what's been going on. Uh, the uh, uh, as Matthew said, the witness statement um, should, when exchanged, normally contain all the evidence you're going to give at trial, but if something genuinely arises later on that you couldn't have anticipated, uh, it, you're usually justified in uh, serving a supplementary statement to deal with that new point. Uh, so th those are some additional points about specific performance. Uh, and moving on then to the final slide, um, after trial and dealing with costs. In disrepair claims, you'll often have um, offers and counter offers that have gone backwards and forwards. If there's been quite a few of those, it may be useful to have a separate bundle um, of without prejudice correspondence. Of course, that uh, shouldn't be filed with the court because a judge shouldn't see it uh, when they do their pre-reading for trial, um, but have it ready uh, in a physical, cop physical form uh, with counsel if the trial's in person. Uh, or ready to go on email um, if the trial is done remotely by CVP. Do use part 36. So you'll have your, uh, assuming you're in a fast or multi-track trial rather than a small claims trial, uh, but most disrepair claims aren't uh, on the small claims track. It, use part 36, the rules on costs. You'll have your overall statement of costs for the entire proceedings. Uh, which you'll obviously rely on if you're the successful party. If uh, you have had uh, a Part 36 offer that you've made um, and you think you're going to beat it, then consider as well having another statement of costs which sets out the costs that you've incurred after that offer expired. Because if you beat it, you'll then get your costs on the indemnity basis um, and uh, interest on them as well. Um, so it, it is often worth doing that separate exercise uh, with a statement of costs. Uh, and finally, if costs um, look particularly high or unusual um, in a particular section, it's always helpful to brief your counsel on why that is so they're ready to deal with it when it comes to the assessment at the end of trial. Uh, so uh, that is the um, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, as a reminder, I, I'm Stefan Liberadsky and uh, Matthew McDermott, my colleague, um, gave you the first part of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening and we hope you found it helpful. Um, if you have any particular questions arising from that, um, do feel free to uh, drop us an email. The, uh, while we can't uh, give, uh, the, we'll give the usual disclaimer that we can't give legal advice uh, and this presentation isn't legal advice uh, on any particular case, uh, we're happy to answer any general queries um, that you might have thought about while watching this. So thank you very much.